Now let's try it. Okay, good. Good, good. I think you heard me, though, because I was probably being loud, most of you. But we have resurrected ministry education in this region in the Russell School of Ministry. And so that is part of what we're doing in Florence. We also have the George Mark Elliott Library there. And if you've got a, a seniors group that likes to get out and take some trips, you need to give us a call and schedule and come over and take a tour of not just the library, where we have many, many restoration movement periodicals and books dating back to the 1800s. But we also have artifacts from all over the world that years ago we had to keep kind of locked away behind walls, but now we have the space and the place to bring all that out, and you would be amazed at some of the things that we have there, so I'd encourage you to do that. But this morning, I also want to go back in time a little bit as we get into the message, but I want you to think with me this morning about something that you, in your lifetime, wanted, and you wanted it really, really bad. Now, you youngsters right here in the front, Christmas is coming, right? Have you got some things that you really want bad? Yeah, okay. And so we're, adults, we're the same way. And not too long ago, La Rosa's, how many of you like La Rosa's? Oh, sure. They had a slogan called, you really want it bad. You really want it bad. So have you got something in your mind that you really wanted bad? Maybe it wasn't 40 or 50 years ago. Maybe it was just last week you saw something or you were thinking of something you really wanted it bad. Well, for me, I want to go back and start at the, in the first grade. Now, I didn't realize that my family didn't have a lot of money until really I got to school, until we were in the first grade. And so one of the things you had to have was crayons, right? You had to have a box of crayons when you went to school. So it wasn't, wasn't too long into the day and the teacher passed out these sheets that we were going to do some coloring. So up came the desktops. Remember the old desktops that came up? And out came the crayons. I was really proud. I had a brand new box of eight crayons that I could put down on the desk, and I was ready to go. And I started looking around, and I saw 16 crayons. And I thought, wow, that's twice as mine. I oh, in 32 crayons I saw somewhere else. And then there was a boy named Gary Yi, Chinese, that later he and I became really good friends, but he had a box of 64 crayons with a sharpener in the side of it. And I thought, man, I want those crayons. And when I think back on it, I probably wanted those crayons more than anything later in my life, even much bigger things, but that feeling, that sentiment was so strong. I wanted those 64 crayons. Isn't that amazing though? Some, no matter how big we get in life later, someone always has more crayons, right? When I told this story in church probably 20 years ago, a lady bought me a box of 64 crayons <laughs> and she gave it to me. And so then somebody else said, well, that's, that's not good enough. And then I found out there was a box of 96 crayons and somebody gave me that box. If there's a bigger box, I don't want to know. But I, I had those crayons sitting on my dresser for probably 20, 25 years. And every morning when I got up, they would remind me of some very important things. But in the last couple of years now, I, my wife and I, we have four grandchildren. And so there's two in, in two families. And so I was able to give one family 64 crayons and another one 96 crayons. So now they're enjoying my crayons. So it just goes on and on, doesn't it? Someone always has a newer car, a faster computer, a bigger house, better looks, and that's where we are as a society. But I really like my crayons because they were much cheaper than a Ferrari. Didn't have to worry about getting caught up in all of that. But as a society, even as Christians, we spend much of our time in the pursuit of perishable products, don't we? 
Why do we have so much trouble with this? Sometimes we want to covet or copy what someone else has. And sometimes I even want to use the word counterfeiting. We're counterfeiting ourselves a little bit sometimes when we get off on that tangent. And so I will come back to that in just a, in just a little bit. But if we aren't careful, we can be counterfeiting our own lives. You know, it's not been long ago that the United States Treasury came out with these new $100 bills, and they put all kinds of ribbons and coloring in there because it was so easy to counterfeit those, those older bills. But it's always there, the opportunity or the temptation to maybe counterfeit ourselves and, and not be who we really are. Psalm 103 reminds us that it is God who made us and not we ourselves. Psalm 139, 14 reads that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But we're never going to be positive and productive entities until we, we learn that and take it to heart. So to see how we get off track in all this, I want to go back to the beginning. When God created us, he did three things to give us this crystal clear concept of what it is to be a living soul. He gave us an intellect, he gave us minds. He also gave us emotion, and then he gave us our will. Have you ever been told you were a strong-willed child when you were growing up? He gave us a will. But in the beginning, all these things were very important. And he started out with Adam in the Garden of Eden. You know the story. But Adam had this new, this new intellect, this mind that God had created him with. And so God said, you know what, Adam? Let's check out your, your thinking capacity here. I want you to name things that I've created. I want you to name plants. I want you to name trees, animals. Go ahead and do some of that. So Adam's walking around, you know, and he's, well, oak tree, uh, camel, uh, giraffe. And he's doing all this naming and categorizing of things. And I, I think that would probably get you tired the first time you exercised your brain like that. And so the Bible says that he fell, fell into a deep sleep. He laid down and took a nap. I think he was just tired and worn out. But when he woke up, there was this new creature that God created. And he took one look and he said, whoa, man. Some of you will get that on the way home. But that's what he did. He gave us that mind, that intellect. He also gave us an emotion that we can use to express love more than any, any other good reason. It's through our emotions that we can express love. And finally, we have this will so that we can do things volitionally on our own merit, on our own design. So you take these three things and put them together, and they allow us to know God, to love God, and last, to obey God by exercising that will. But if we haven't had a quiet, peaceful moment in a while, it's probably because one of these things has gotten out of whack. Because you see, our mind is made for truth. There's no fiction or fantasy that will satisfy it for very long. And our emotions are made for righteousness, to feel right with God. And if something's wrong in that area, we just have this perpetual discontent, like this itching on our skin. And the will of man was made for submission and obedience. So these things were all working perfectly well. But then comes along the wrinkle, Satan, an alien influence. Because Satan, as one of God's creations, decided to go independent of the creator. In Isaiah, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, you can read all about Satan's fall. But in there, there are four things that he was all about. He wanted restrictions from no one. He didn't want to be responsible to anyone. He wanted no instructions from God. But he did want to rule over everyone that he could conquer or take along in the way that he wanted them to go. So when Satan begins to influence us, we can start loving the wrong things. 
perishable instead of permanent. As a result, our mind can become all darkened. Our emotions get distorted and our will becomes deadened. We, we just don't have any capacity to follow God. In essence, we go on a detour of God's plan when Satan is allowed to disrupt. So whenever Satan sees something that's orderly and operating in, in the way that the divine creator wanted it to be, he's going to step in and try to mess that up. He showed up and spoke in the garden. Didn't take long, did it? He also spoke to God about Job, and then he even tried to tempt the very son of God, Jesus. So he's, he's always trying to do those things, and he's not going to stop until that one day. So all these times when things are going for the creator, that's when he shows up. So if you think things are going great, be on your guard. He's going to show up. But some of us today might, be, might say things aren't going well. You know, maybe some of these things are a little out of whack. But I want you to realize that nearly everything God has placed or created has meaning in it for one significant contribution before the ultimate sacrifice. The chicken, we get eggs from chickens. And those eggs have gotten really expensive, haven't they? But until the chicken makes the ultimate sacrifice and gets in the pot, you know, it's, it's the, contrib the contribution every day of eggs. A cow, we like that milk. Think of anybody that's well known. How about Joe Burrow? Who's going to watch the game today? It's a later game, right? How about the Wright brothers? What did they do? Or Shakespeare or any others. But I believe that each one of us can say that I'm the right person in the right time, in the right place. Why? Because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I need to remember that God blesses what he creates. But if we spend our lives copying, coveting, and counterfeiting, it sort of borders on the realm of not trusting and not following God's creativity in us. God does three things. He initiates life. He terminates life through time, when it's that time for life to terminate. And then the last thing God does is he evaluates life. He looks over what we've done, what we've accomplished through him and his will. So I think a good thing to, to realize is, therefore, we just ought to let God operate life, don't you think? Now, this brings us to the man of our Old Testament text that I want to share this morning. He's got to be one of your favorite Bible characters. There's no doubt in my mind. He's a household name. This morning as you were eating breakfast, you probably talked about him. Some of you here uh, might name children after him. His name is Shamgar. Write that down now. Shamgar. Now, he is found in Judges 3.31. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad. He, too, saved Israel. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you this morning that we can come together from the cares and concerns of this world for this time to worship you, to acknowledge the mighty things you've done, but most of all, to acknowledge, Father, who you are. You are God the Father, God the creator of all, God the sustainer. And Father, I pray this morning that everything that we uh, say here and do here, that you will be the basis, the boundary, the sum, and the circumference of all that. Help us to take this obscure man in Scripture, but yet you put him there for a reason. Help us to take that and apply it to our very lives. We pray these things in your son's great and powerful name. And amen. So God is such an economist with words. Why did he put this short passage in if there wasn't something there that it could tell us? He's in the book of Judges, and there are many well-known judges in that book of Judges. And some of these, Deborah, we know all the stories and others, but we don't know, we don't tell stories about Shamgar. 
But I think there's something here that we can catch in this, in this brief time we have. And before I, I attempt to share this with you, I think I can say this. It's really all you need to know about life if you want to just look at it simplistically. So let's look at these principles. The first principle is he used what he had. He used what he had. I'm going to tell you something really profound. It's very hard to use what you don't have. Would you agree? It's much easier to use what you have. But sometimes we just decide to wish and whine and criticize and murmur and grumble because we don't have something. When we murmur, it displeases God. In Numbers 11.1, 1, it says he can become angry. In essence, he's saying, I've given you what you need. Just use it. Trying to use what we don't have takes on many forms. We see people all the time trying to live outside their means intentionally. They get into difficulty. And I'm not talking about someone who's lost a job or has un unknown medical bills that come along. I'm talking about we've made a step forward. We've used that will. And we've done something. The number one reason for filing bankruptcy, 70% is overextended credit usually on credit cards. Here's a simple fact. If you had a $3,000 credit card debt and it was at 19% interest and you said, I'm stopping right here, I'm gonna charge no more, but you just pay the minimum, it'll take 39 years to pay that off with $10,000 in interest. So that's over a three to one loss really on paying out in interest. But I know here in this passage, it does not say Shamgar had a credit card. No, he didn't have one. It says he had an ox code, a long, pointy pole, very sharp on the end, and used to motivate the ox. And it says that he took that ox code and he took out 600 of the Philistines. I think that's one of the main reasons he's listed here because of what he did with that ox goat. God is in the business of commending people who use what they have. Moses didn't have a civil engineer. He didn't have the carnival cruise line to get all around. He had a rod in his hand. Rahab, no elevator, just a rope. Samson had a jawbone. David had a slingshot with five smooth stones. There was this boy with some fish and some loaves. There was a widow who had two mites, but the Bible talks about her. It commends her for using her two mites. She didn't have CDs or stocks. They recorded because what they had, and they used it. Dorcas had a needle. Barnabas had land. We could go on and on. But when we are creative with what we, we have, we're a lot like God when we are being creative. Many of us are here today simply because we had parents that used what they had, and that's why we've made it. If I'm talking to somebody here uh, who's waiting for their big moment, a big inheritance, the lottery, then I'll get going. When I get that, I'll get going. God says no. You have to use what you simply have. The way you go from the minors to the majors is to use what you have in the minors. But the reason some of us have trouble is because we're always comparing and competing. Instead of celebrating the creativity of God in us to make a special, unique contribution that we can make. God is so kind and creative that he has arranged for every person to be the best in one area of life, and that is being yourself as you were created. Our fingerprints, our DNA, make us different and unique. Because we woke up this morning and we can fog a mirror, God still has a plan and intention for us. I'm never going to hit a baseball like Ken Griffey or preach like Wayne Smith or Bob Russell but I'm the best there ever was at being me the way God created me and set me up to do what he needs me to do. So that's what we need to do. 
Do what you have and use that. Now, the second thing Shamgar did is he started where he was. Something I've learned, it's hard to start where you're not. You know, I started out on my journey through life with 20 chickens and some vegetables in a garden, and I became a salesman at the age of 10 and started selling things. But later on, when I was about 17 years old, I left home and I joined the Marine Corps, and I ended up spending 20 years. But I didn't get to start out as a major where I was when I retired. I had to start out as a private marching in the heat and sand fleas of Paris Island, South Carolina. We have to start where we are, where we are now, and get going. It doesn't matter how old we are. I've retired twice, and I keep coming out of retirement because God keeps showing me things that I still have the capability to do for him. So I continue to do that. So where did he start? Now, this is something that I'm deducing. I think he started on his farm because of the tool of his trade, the ox goat. And we know how motivating that would be to the ox, right? That sharp stick. But during this time, the Philistines had occupied this territory that had been set apart for Israel. And they were disrupting God's plan just like Satan tries to do. Now, in Judges 5, 6, these are the only two passages here we have a clue about what was going on in that time with Shamgar. But in Judges 5, 6, this is what was likely happening. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the roads were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths. Judges 5, 6. So these Philistine soldiers, they were on the main roads. So the citizens most likely didn't want to tangle with those soldiers, and they took the shortcut paths that we have. I'm sure there's a lot of paths and shortcut roads around here. Everything leads to the river, right? But there are all these paths and shortcuts. And so this was a military operation, sort of like martial law. So the citizens were off the main roads. Now, I've been around young soldiers and young Marines, and when they're on a post, when they're on a mission, on a place, they get bored really easily sometimes, and they kind of like to wander off and maybe take a few side road treks through these paths. And guess what I think happened? I, th I think they just became curious, you know, what's over here around this hill or this? and they began to take shortcuts across property. Did you ever take a shortcut and wish you hadn't? Taking shortcuts can sometimes result in a really bad decision. Well, I think these Philistines had done just that. A newspaper reporter once asked a bank president, what is the secret of your success? Two words was the reply, right decisions. Well, how do you make right decisions? One word, experience. Well, how do you get experience? Two words, bad decisions. It's my contention that some of these Philistines made bad decisions and experienced the wrath of Shamgar as they began to take shortcuts across his property. One by one, two by two, he took them out. The Bible doesn't say he killed them in one sweeping engagement, one display of total strength and sheer overwhelming? No. I believe to get to this 600, he did it day after day, time after time, until he got to 600. Great things can happen one at a time, one by one, one day at a time. The church grows one at a time, as the Lord adds. Marriages are built one day at a time. God wants to develop you and me through one opportunity at a time. As long as we have breath, we have contributions to make. Shamgar was no extraordinary person like Samson. He was ordinary and obscure like most of the people God makes. Let's face it, most of us are like the rest of us. 
And finally, he did what he could. So are you ready to start today? You know what? What he did was enough. And the Bible says he delivered Israel. Some translations say he saved Israel. That's why he's mentioned. The Philistines pulled out. They got out of there. Every morning at roll call, back at the camp, they're having roll call. Elliot, Parks, Walters. No answer. People are missing one by one, one by one. Finally, the efforts of this obscure man paid off. So from this example, we can see that all it would really take is these three principles applied in our life to see a great difference made. Now let's review. What did he do? He started where he was, he used what he had, and he did what he could. Those three things, those three simple things. What if five people said, I'm ready to make a difference? I've got some free advice for you. If you're in something today, get really in it, go for it. If you're not, if it's the wrong thing, get out and find what God has imbued you with to be able to do. Don't be afraid to listen to God's call in your life. The preacher in Ecclesiastes 9.10 reminds us, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. So we need to stop all this counterfeiting and coveting. We're all born genuine originals, but some of us are headed toward death as a carbon copy of somebody else or something else that we're really not. So that's our part in this. But there's another part. And as we begin to celebrate this Christmas season, I just, I need to talk about it. When I was very small, there was a hero figure on TV that I liked for a reason I didn't understand until much later in life. He helped those who were downtrodden he was an oppressed, and he came from on high at just the right time. Here I come to save the day. Who was that? Come on, guys, the Mighty Mouse, right? Now, some of you younger folks, maybe have never seen Mighty Mouse, and I apologize for that, but I loved Mighty Mouse because you know what? I used to think there should be someone like that who can save the day at just the right time. And so later on, I heard about the one who fills heaven with all his glory and earth with all of his blessings. He walked around with more medicine and healing in the hem of his garments than all the drugstores in town. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about Jesus. The one who spanked the riverbeds with his hand and made the rivers change course. That's who we're talking about. He came into my life one day, but you know how he got there? He started where he was. He deferred to the plan of God, his father, and said, yes, father, I will go. I will go because you want me to go. I don't know if it's going to be a pleasant thing, but you want me to do it, and I'm going to go do it. In Galatians 4, 4 through 5, we read, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. So he came down to birth, came down to earth and was born of the Virgin Mary in the city of David, wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger. He grew in wisdom and knowledge and went out doing good everywhere he went. On the dusty shores of Jerusalem, northern part of Galilee. He started where he was. What else did he do? He did what he could, what nobody else could do. He was the right person in the right period for the right purpose. He died. He died on a hill called Calvary. How long did he die? He died until the grave got sick to its stomach and gave up his prey. Picture the elements erupting and suffering fits of almost what we would call cosmic epilepsy. He died until Mary came running, 
running to see that he was not there. He died until the centurion said, surely this must have been the son of God. Maybe somebody here needs to know him, know him by name. He was sturdy in his steps and silent in his suffering. The shepherd of our souls and the sacrifice for all of our sins and sovereign in his actions. I'm glad he was the servant of the father, aren't you? He started where he was. He did what only he could do and he used what he had, what, what was required for him to use that he had. It was his blood. It wasn't spilled. It was shed. He gave it freely because God told him, if you lay down your life, you have the power to take it up again. You have the power to come back. And so he was willing to give his blood. So if we have been bought by his blood, if we are re reborn as a believer today, we know that that has made us whole. It can do that. It washes away all sin. So before this hour ends, if you're here and you need to talk to someone about that, what that really means in your life, how it could be applied to you, then make sure you talk to someone before you go. Talk to Adam, talk to one of the elders. You can even come and talk to me if you want. But talk to someone today. So in a little, in a little while, we're going to have the, the worship band come up here in just a few minutes. They can start making their way probably up here now. I want to finish with this. In April of 1912, the great ship Titanic was lost. As loved ones waited for news, eventually two lists were posted in New York. Those who were lost and those who were saved. And so it will be the same one day, this time two lists for all the earth. I know the list that I want to be on, and I know that many of you are on that list, but think about those who you know that may not be headed for being on that list, and let's do something while we have the chance. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the season when we remember the fact that your son wanted to come and give his life, carry out your plan, and do what you needed him to do. Father, that he would leave the great comfort he had with you, but he would come down and endure things that he did not deserve whatsoever. But he did it because he loved us so. I pray, Father, that as we go out this week, we'll have joy in our heart, spring in our step, as we think about what you have done for us. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Mm -hmm.